You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, former prep course ops superintendent and current special reconnaissance training guru, Trent Segmiller. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another Ones Ready podcast. I know you've been looking forward to it all week. Uh, You went onto the site and you already subscribed and you already hit notifications, uh, and I appreciate it. I appreciate all you out there supporting us uh, so we can get you the information that you need. Uh, Big news this week before we get into what we're going to talk about, which is maybe the best thing that we could talk about. We have a new company that we're like affiliated with that doesn't pay us, but we just want to give them a shout out and give you guys a code to get a discount. Uh, So the new company is Out of Regs Pomade. As you know, we talk about hair all the time. It's just, it is what it is. So go to Out of Regs Pomade, put in the ones ready code and you're going to get yourself a 10% discount. That's Out of Regs with an S, not a Z. Uh, They're not posers. Uh, And just like always, (laughs) the other companies that we uh, give shout outs to and they uh, offer a discount as well is Hoist, get yourself hydrated. It works. Uh, Strike Force Energy, get yourself um, uncomfortably energetic. Alpha Brew Coffee Company, for all you coffee <laughs> no. snobs, and you know, get yourself regular energetic. It's great stuff. Aaron can tell you all about it. And then last but not least, Everly Stock. Get yourself a bag, get yourself some kit, uh, train like the pros, and uh, you're going to love their stuff. And just to put it out there, we only talk about these companies because we love them. We use their products, and uh, they're fantastic people. They support us. You support us. We appreciate it. Um, last thing is, yeah, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everything. Make sure you go on there, like, subscribe, leave us comments, uh, and uh, tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So now that that's out of the way, this week is story time. Y'all been asking for it. We're going to deliver. We're going to tell the funny stories. And then, um, you know, Peaches is going to tell us about what it's like trying to get stuff off the top shelf. It's going to be a great time. So I just want to, I, I, no matter what this episode turns out to be, that was the best <laughs> intro of all time. Like, I hope everybody listened to, to every well-organized and thought out, man, that was great. I just, for a little behind the curtains for everybody, we decided about three seconds before we started recording this one, hey, who's hosting? We were like, hey, Trent, you do it. So you got what you got, man. That was that was great <laughs> for, for, for knowing just prior to hitting that record button. <laughs> it's not a bad shot at a big guy. I appreciate it. So I think we'll, <laughs> we'll start with, uh, we'll go uh, youngest to oldest. Uh, you know, fun stories. Brian, you are the voice of reason here. You brought us all together. Hit us up. Tell us a story uh, that's exciting or funny. Uh, just that shed some light on, on all of your awesome experiences as a PJ. Well, I'm not that much younger, just to put it out there, but uh, (laughs) I I do have the the least amount of time in service for sure. Um, All right. So I was thinking about it the past couple of days and which story I wanted to tell. And I'm going to hit the Favignano wine mixer with J-Mac, which is a really great story. And I think I've posted about it before and I'm sure Aaron, Peach, you've heard about it before, but... um, In in lore, (laughs) in lore only. Yeah. So I want to bring J-Mac on that one because... Yeah, I definitely want to bring J-Mac in. Uh, so he'll come back for that one and for a different story time. But I know, Aaron, some of the stories that we have are also kind of shared. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about was obviously none of the stuff that we're going to be talking about is going to be classified or any of that kind of stuff. It's just a funny time that we've been in training and, or wherever. And uh, we just want to share it with you guys because it just sticks out in our minds. So the one that was sticking out in my mind was... Uh, I don't know if it was because I had just kind of gotten in some trouble with a commander or not, but he sent me to the allied officers winter warfare course (laughs) and, uh, (laughs) me and, and old dust bunny were, um, (laughs) sent there with Grizzbiz and, uh, it was a whole, you know, fun group that was down there. And allied officer winter warfare course is a course that they hold up there in Norway and it's for allied officers. That thing is a suck fest. It is. Yeah. So, it's so cold. You spend so for the people that don't like understand. So, no kidding. The Norwegians were authorized by NATO to be the only people that can say you you get to stay out in winter conditions longer than twenty four hours. Mm-hmm. So as a as a three twenty first guy or as a as a Mildenhall STS guy, we had the opportunity to go over 
to this course and take it. But it's like there's like a ten day <laughs> uh, initial movement. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, quotes. Yeah, there's like a uh, there's like a ten day initial like uh, movement that you did. You came in and you warmed up for a couple of days, and then you went for this big tactical exercise. But it was like. I mean, what was it, six weeks long or something? It was awesome. Yeah. Cold response. Holy Fantastic. Crap. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, and, and then when you went to the, a yeah. separate the one, exercise. that was a separate event. You got, but yeah, you got to wear your Gucci course. gear to that one. You didn't have to wear the yeah, for Norwegian sure. gear to that You're one. You're wearing the same gear as the Norwegian conscripts are wearing out in yeah. the wilderness. And it's literally like a mesh, like the mesh that you wear to the beach, like those people back in the 80s that were wearing hot pink mesh tank the tops. strings. Yeah, those strings. You're wearing yeah. that. Google it, kids. Um, They're so it's good. Actually, it. They're so good. It actually warm. works. Yeah. <laughs> they are, yeah. It works really well. Remember uh, Wright said Fred? The I'm too sexy video, that guy was probably Norwegian because that mesh shirt of his is exactly what they are. That is exactly what you're wearing, and you're wearing a Gore-Tex over that. Um, anyway, so it was me, uh, Dust Bunny. I'm going to code everyone's name, you know, use eponyms or whatever for everyone's name. But we actually call these people that just to hide their identity. You guys know them as Dust Bunny. So we were out there. Um, it was during our 10-day movement, like you said. Um, they have you jump into a 30, it was negative 35 degrees outside and the sun's pretty much always in a permanent state of setting or like sort of rising just over the horizon. It's always dark over there. So, um, it's starting to get dark again and they, we pull up to this lake on our skis after a 30 kilometer, uh, little ski adventure. And they tell you that we're going to jump into this, uh, this frozen lake. Or it's frozen. That they actually have piece. to cut a hole yeah. in with like huge chainsaws. Yeah. It's not even like, yeah, it's not even just like, oh, okay, we're going to use it like on ice saw. Like, no, they had to bring in like heavy duty because they were like, yeah, this this lake is essentially almost always frozen. Like in the summer, it really doesn't unthaw that that well. Like the mm. deep parts of it are still really cold. So you're like, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. It's cool, 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 cool. It's cool. absolutely freezing cold. And for me, I, I'm a guy that grew up in Arizona. So, you know, the coldest stuff, that's not my kind of gear. Obviously, I'll go out there and I'll do the job and I'll have minimal complaining as much as possible. There's still going to be some because that's just what happens when you're around a group of people and you're miserable. You have that shared well, that's what NCOs fest. do. Yeah. NCOs I'm are supposed Shane to complain. I'm on this one, man. I'm... <laughs> I'm more of a fair weather PJ. I'm more of like an inside <laughs> cat sort of guy. Like, I, man, that that course for reason, man, that's way outside of my temperature. It was terrible. Range. I remember just like going to the bathroom, you know, doing number two out there in the in the woods. You got to burn your toilet paper. You got to obviously take your gloves off to try and wipe, and it's just literally a pain in the butt to try and figure out if your hand or the tissues is wiping. So because you can't feel your fingers. But the thing that I wanted to get to that was also funny was, um, so I was watching, you know, I saw Jake go in the lake first, um, and he just had this look on his face. He was like looking up, kind of like praying, and he was just like, oh, please, just let this be over soon. Let me feel my fingers again soon. So I saw him jump in the lake, <laughs> and he was just struggling. I can just imagine Jake looking at you just like, help. <laughs> yeah. I have a picture of it, actually. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it up here. <laughs> uh, it's blurry enough so you can't really see him that well. Um, he's a recruiter now. If you know him, then go ahead and ask him the story. Anyway, so yeah. uh, I saw him jump out. He comes out and he's freezing and he takes off his clothes and everything. You have to change out of your clothes and you have to get next to the fire and warm up and do all your stuff. You have like your broth and everything kind of uh, figured out before you jump in so you can try and warm up as fast as possible because you're staying in, in the cold for a couple days after this. It's not like you're going straight back to a hotel or anything. So, um, I saw him do that and I was like, all right, here we go. So you have to, when you jump in, it's a big old like 20 by 20 square that they cut out. You jump in, you have your skis on, you have your ruck on, you have all of your gear and your hat and everything. And you jump in and you got to get your skis and you got to climb out, pull yourself out. And then you got to run about 800 meters or so to the fire where the, all your stuff is. And then you got to change out of your clothes. So I did all that. And by the time I got over to where all my clothes were, um, you know, dust, you had a partner that was helping you like do stuff because you can't feel your fingers at that point. Um, so I started <laughs> dust bunny was, uh, over there helping me take off all my stuff and get my warm stuff on. So I took off worst person ever too. Yeah. I hope he's listening right now. I hope you hear <laughs> worst partner to have at this point of all the people in my Rolodex of like phone of friends. If I had to put myself back in this scenario and you're like, all right, pick these a hundred people. And the hundredth one was, was dust money. And I was like, well, I know which one it isn't. All right. Now what was the other 99? <laughs> Absolutely. So I start taking off my jacket. I took off all the stuff on top, you know, my 
chest and my legs are kind of exposed. I took my pants down and we're just naked here. I forgot to take off my socks first though. So like my pants are stuck in my socks and I can't pull them off my socks. So I have Dustin. <laughs> I'm like, Dustin, you need, you need to take my freaking pants off. I can't do it. So he's like down there at my ankles. Well, obviously, uh -oh. my pants are and just like, dude, take all my pants. So he finally like yanks it off. He's like, fine, whatever. And obviously it's freezing out there. Um, but that, I think that's a graphic enough picture for you to imagine the struggle that we we're going through at that point, <laughs> you know, everything is fantastic. frozen and we're trying to just get everything. Literally my shoelace was, by the time I got over to the, the site, my shoelace was frozen outward, like to the side and like a stick of spaghetti or something like that when it's dry. So it was really cold out there just to give you that kind of picture. But, uh, yeah, that was a really great time. Um, after that, you know, we got a little bit closer. We, uh, became really good friends. So I appreciated him being able to help me, but that's the kind of friends that you have whenever you go into special warfare. Sounds like yeah. a lot closer. Yeah. Old, yeah. Well, I mean, old, yeah. Old dust buns. You know, the weird thing about that breaking through ice trail with me was it was the same thing. It was like negative 35. The initial thought I had when I hit that water, I was like, Oh wait, this is actually a lot warmer than the outside air. Like just for a second, I was like, wait, this is, this is a full 40 degrees warmer. It is. And it was cause I was like, Oh, wait a second. And I was like, Oh God, no, get out of this water <laughs> right now. It was just freezing. It's terrible. I was like, Oh man, it lasted for the briefest moment. Yeah. Like we're pretty coordinated swimmers too. And I felt like at that point with all yeah. the stuff on and my skis, just like, I don't even know what I'm doing right now. I can't feel myself in the water. I can't like, I'm just like a dog trying to paddle to the edge. So it was a, it was a good time like people don't understand how big those packs were too like we're using uh, the regular norwegian their bergens like it's not a normal backpack it's definitely not like something you'd find at rei it's like the world's biggest pack just dragging you underneath the freezing yeah, water they don't give you any marmot sleeping bags so it takes up about i don't know most of your backpack at least the longest part of your uh, upper back up to your head it goes up past your head well you also have the skis on too yeah so yeah. i mean you got to deal with that the whole sticks and everything yeah so that's my trend <laughs> awesome you can go ahead and bounce on to the next oldest person <laughs> well uh let's move on to aaron i think aaron. the next oldest person is you but yeah yeah but i'm in charge so i did the intro <laughs> <laughs> oh, it all agrees, it's like, yeah. <laughs> the decision you before <laughs> you're in my world now jackass <laughs> my one's ready team room today i <laughs> <laughs> man that was very that was very forceful i eat at the end too well this one's gonna be good because brian was involved in it but uh it's the it's the anchor story now oh, snap. the anchor story it depends on how you kind of view this one this was either uh probably the most successful joint operation that happened our entire deployment <laughs> or a theft of an international sort of symbol so either way that you looked at it it's uh, it was still a success, and, and what it was we did, we open just... international. Nobody owned that section. <laughs> that <we were> just... <laughs> national water. Listen, I don't. Nobody had claimed that anchor in hundreds of years, if I'm judging this correctly. So, there, uh, there, Brian and I were, we were uh, deployed um, together. It was a, a pretty quiet deployment, except for um, about halfway through. So we'd been going off to this one specific dive site, and we were on Africa, time unnamed. There was this dive site that we used to use where you could go and basically just tether up and then go dive, but you could go like 60 feet. So for the non divers out there, 60 feet, you can stay there for about an hour less than that. You get more time on the bottom. That's a ton of time. I had never understood why people liked diving like scuba diving before these events, because it was like, you could see just as far as you could see. And it was clear blue and it was warm. You're in like shorts and a t-shirt. Maybe like sometimes you dive with like no t-shirt. You just dived out and it was fine. It was like, beautiful sparkling water was off the and coast and way everywhere. out of the marina yeah. it was awesome Dude, yeah man. and the fish would just swim right up to you it was crazy um so yeah so it was near this place well there was also an anchor that was kind of how you marked it on the gps to get there is you'd be like yeah you go to the anchor and we used to use it for a bunch of stuff we would train out there too and we'd be like you know blacked out mask and you would try to find things and you'd say hey put this three o'clock from the anchor or whatever so it was a, a huge reference point obviously it was a big anchor so Long story short, we're on a on a navy base, and our show or our uh, space is sort of on a deployment. Get like show and tell. Like they'll bring people through. They'll be like, "Oh, here's the PR team, and here's their 
gear in their kit. Sometimes it's cool, and sometimes it's like Washington Redskin cheerleaders, and sometimes it's just congressmen or people that they want to bring in. Anyway, long story short, this thing happens, and one of the Navy chiefs that was in the group is like, we uh, mentioned that we had been diving the day before and that we saw an anchor, and he goes, oh, well, you know, it's a it's a Navy tradition that every Navy base is anchored. There's a big anchor that's displayed, and it's a it's a Navy good luck thing, and there's not one here. So literally, me being the person I am, I was like, oh, you need an anchor? I can get you an anchor. And we kind of started joking around about it in the in the middle of the team room, and guys started la- laughing. Well, the the two relieves, and you know, as things go, like dudes go and work out, we eat dinner. Later that night, my my good friend Isaac <laughs> kind of looks turns to me. And he's like, you think we could really get that anchor? <laughs> I was like. I don't know, man. We'd have to start talking about it with the boys. So we get Kyle, we get Brian, we get the guys together. We're like, hey, we're thinking about going to, to go to that anchor. You guys want to? You guys want to take a look at that chain? Because there was a huge shipping chain, like those big links that you see like in museums and stuff that was on there, right? And it like we don't even know how far that chain went. We always joked about following that chain, like dusting it off and like finding the ship that it was attached to, because it was like it just kind of like got buried, and we never like really dug anything up, right? So we were like, step one, got to get off that chain. So we're like, all right, uh. Yeah, we're like, hey, when you guys go out on the next dive, just kind of look at that chain and see if it could break apart, you know, for for reasons. <laughs> so they go and they start like they looked at it. They came back. They were like, I don't know. It's too thick. We'd have to see if we could break it apart. So we started having this discussion like EOD. Do you remember the EOD guys offering to blow it apart for us? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> the EOD guys were like, yeah, because they were <laughs> they were divers, too. And they were like, we kind of told them about it. They were like. Oh no, we got underwater charges for that. We'll just blow it apart. <laughs> we were like, wait, for real? Is this a real thing? <laughs> underwater so like, All right. is super safe in case it doesn't matter. <laughs> Listen, man, international waters. So the uh, the EOD, we bring the EOD guys out and they dive on it. Well, they're looking at it on their dive. They go out, like my friend Isaac comes running in after their dive and he's like, Aaron, guess what? I was like, what? He was like, I'm not going to imitate Isaac's Southern Ohio accent. He's like, Aaron. Guess what? <laughs> I was like, what, Isaac? Big old dip in, yeah. So he's the <laughs> big old dip in, big old lipper, just a huge one. So he's like, we're down there playing around with this chain, playing FF games. So we go to pick it up to see if we can get the jaws around it. And guess what? It broke. <laughs> and I was like, what? He was like, it was just rusted. It basically disintegrated in my hands. So I was like, uh oh, boys, we're in business. Game on. So we started having these conversations. Yeah, exactly. So we started having these conversations over the next couple of days. And it's like, all right, well, it's basic mission planning. Like, okay, well, how are we going to get it to the surface? So we're like, well, we can have lift bags. We can do this other stuff. Isaac and I, late one night around the ping pong table, we're like, what if we took Zodiacs down and blew up Zodiacs underneath it? Like basically lift bagged it to the surface. Because then the problem is, how do you get it from the surface to wherever, right? So we had some 53s, Marine 53s that could sling load it. But we didn't have a way to get it like to be sling loaded because it's in the water, right? <laughs> We're like, well, that's way too dangerous is tying it on the thing in the water. So we got to find a platform for it. So we're like, all right, well, the dive team will take Zodiacs underneath, fill it up with air, bring it to the surface, poof, Bob's your uncle. Now it's on the top. And now you can sling load it. I think so I've we're seen like, this episode oh. on like the History Channel or Discovery. It this was sounds, on the A team. You guys <laughs> yeah. definitely should have recorded all this. You could have. We have videos. So Brian and I will post videos and stuff and, and a couple stories or whatever. We, we have videos of the entire operation. So we figured that piece out. We figured like it was going to work, but we couldn't like really practice any of this, by the way. Like th- we just sort of like came up with this wacky plan. So we had our army friends that were the special forces dudes down there from Fort Carson. They were the sling load experts. They were helping us at the sling load process. We had uh, Navy and Air Force divers that went down and actually like secured the um lift bags and stuff and got everything ready there then i was on board the marine helicopter that we actually recovered it and then we dropped it off on base to the navy and their cbs came and picked it up so it was like no kidding like all four services were representing this entire thing from all the planning and stuff so we get this whole thing planned like we're like here we go lift bags onto the zodiacs onto the sling loads onto the 53s not flying over the town (laughs) with the ancient anchor (laughs) because that would be terrible um on the base, the the CBs will pick it up with their crane and basically flatbed it back to where it's going to go. And then, uh, you know, it'll get cleaned from there and put in there. So we're like, okay, so I will never forget leaving, getting ready to leave. Like the air, all the teams are together. Like we've briefed this meticulously a bunch of times. Like this is not like a cowboy operation. This is an actual brief, like no kidding, multiple times. So we get there and the commander, the deployed commander, his first name is Blake. 
He's a crow slash stow slash BG. So BG looks at everybody and goes, all right, guys, well, here's the deal. You plan for it. You're good. I'd approve this if it was a normal mission. Either this is going to be the best story of all time or I'm about to get fired. Don't die. <laughs> See you later. Well, <laughs> we were all you, like... for, yeah, you forgot that night that we were sta- we stayed up until like, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning, just cutting wood, so inflating, late. making sure the <laughs> tanks were up. Like I remember yeah. me and Isaac were just out in there in the shed that we had, just like measuring stuff and trying to figure out like, well, I think the anchor's probably... Because we had to make a platform yeah. for the Zodiacs too, yeah. Yeah, because the plan was to put... It under a platform. Yeah, because we figured out that was one of the things we figured out. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We were like, so wait a second. So the Zodiac, because of the way that it sat, because we actually like looked at it and we're like, because we had the measurements, we knew how big the anchor was because we like Googled it, the crossbar and stuff. We're like, yeah, but if it sits in there like that, it could catch the Zodiac. Like if the anchor starts coming up, it could somehow <laughs> catch it. So we need a platform for it. So we had to make a plywood platform that we took out that you blew the Zodiacs up and then you sat it on mm-hmm. top of. And then you can see it in the video. Like, you can see the platform that we built uh, on the Zodiac. It was a diabolical plan. I gotta, see, I gotta, see, I gotta see these videos and pictures. <laughs> it was a diabolical plan that we just... Uh, it was wild. Much it was diabolical. Blow, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. But, uh, so, you know, spoiler alert, it was, a, it was a success. And the guys that have deployed there have sent pictures back and uh, shown us the, the anchor that sits outside their chief's mess. I will say the one thing that I asked for, the only thing I asked for... Because I told the chief, I was like, because I was kind of like, I'd get you an anchor. He was like, well, what would you guys want to return? I was like, I will tell you what I want to return. I want to be an honorary shellback. <laughs> like, if you guys don't know the Navy tradition of being a shellback, that stuff is fantastic. When you cross the equator, you get to be a shellback. If you cross the equator and the line, was it line of Meridian, whichever one is north south? If you cross that that thing on that point, you get to be a golden shellback. They have a huge, like, party. It's Just Google it. It's awesome. It's the best thing of all time. Guy never came through for me, though. Go figure. (laughs) Maybe. Really hurt my feelings. The other thing, I have a... That's actually a two-part story, because I want to tell the story. Are you guys familiar with the concept of a deployment girlfriend? (laughs) Nope. For the record, no. (laughs) So, in in this sense, it's a fun game uh, to play. So... The theory uh, is the deployment slash you know boyfriend or girlfriend of the deployment spouse. You are never allowed to speak to this person directly. You're never allowed to actually like acknowledge that they exist. It's somebody that you see in passing, right? But you have to refer to every time you see them at the chow hall. You're like, oh, this was a chow hall date. Or if you see them at the gym, like the same gym that every, oh, we had a gym date. And it becomes a funny joke. The funniest part of this joke is part of the game is before you leave, keep in mind, you've never talked to this person. Before you leave, you have to break up with them in a public place and make it seem heartfelt. So this person that you have never talked to before, you have to walk up in front of the entire team and go, I'm sorry, it's not you. It's me. This could have never worked out. Our families don't get along. And you have to make up a whole story and you have to break up with that person. So it just so happens on the anchor mission, my deployment girlfriend, there was a Marine gunner that went by the call sign Gonzo. She was like top 10% CrossFit athlete in shape. And she used to just, I mean, she was like, probably the best gunner that they had. And she also just ruled with an iron fist. She had like three or four like privates that worked for her. And she, if you were on her bird, like nothing ever went wrong. She was, she was the best. So she was my deployment girlfriend. But shortly after this, I had to break up with her and I used the anchor story. I was like, I thought we were going to be together forever after the anchor story. And she was like, I did all the work on the anchor. You did nothing. And I was like, wow, hurtful in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that is and fantastic. That, and that's, and that's the entire story. Of my anchor story. Oh, the other thing that we didn't really get time. in the... Well, hopefully we have some of it in the video. But I remember one of the funniest part was we were sitting off after we had done all the work and all the anchor was on the boat and everything on the platform. We were sitting off uh, about 800 meters away from where the helicopter was. And if you don't know, the 53s make a mad freaking rotor wash. So these guys and the cable that was going to lift up the anchor is only like 15 feet. And that includes the part that goes into the helicopter. So they're hovering like 10 feet above where the dudes are trying to go. So I just remember like them trying to come in and hit the anchor without blowing it over. And Terp, <laughs> Terp was just on that thing. I think it was Dom that was on the other the other end. He was, it it was, was. Terp and Dom and that were just, just getting crushed. Yeah, they were just getting just pounded. Getting the crushed time. by a 53. <laughs> what year was, was this? Uh, uh, what, what year was that? 2012? Yeah, I think it was 2013. What, what, it was winter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, it was 12 I'm, or 13. This wasn't there, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, this is the real worse. reason like why when your commander gets NSTR, 
like three days in a row, they start panicking and losing sleep. And that's nothing significant to report on like your daily yeah. update to your commander. Because they know that, when, you know, most of us this just don't a- sit around. Things, <laughs> things happen. Here's your plug for story time too, but on the same deployment, we had a real life mermaid on the front of a <laughs> entirely, entirely usable pirate ship that we used to lure people in with candy and hit with water balloons. Old BGD. But that's a story for another time. Old it's going to have to be like a whole nother podcast. This is like Air Force so story time. On deployment, we have, just so you guys are aware, this is obviously a low tempo deployment. And on deployments, we have extra wood for us to build like our team room for us to build whatever we want to build that's just always hanging around because we have to build things and we actually have to use stuff for like uh t ducks or for platforms to send out zodiacs on on uh, c-130s and stuff like that so we actually have to use the wood um but this one obviously low ops tempo we had a bunch of wood that had been lying around for a long time so we got creative and you know the rest of the story we'll tell at a different time i think that's better than building a random bar or something like that personally yeah, I, I like the multifunctional stuff. They had a, a three-level deck um, that you could, I mean, climbing tower on one side, and, and all the decks were usable all the way up. Like, those dudes just, you get uh, you get enough time in a space and enough dudes that all they want to do is go crush stuff. You'll get some projects done quick. Well, I think the best part about the story is you out navied the Navy, so I think that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so I'm always a big fan of that. All right. Uh, uh, so my story is more like a... Uh, it was my second rotation was pretty uh, low tempo as well, and uh, I just remember we went to this uh, place. There's like if you look at a map of Afga- Afghanistan, there's like a finger that pokes out into China. So somewhere in that region, uh, my team went, and it was just like one of those things where like in a week's time, like the weirdest stuff happened, right? So you guys remember watching Rambo Three when you're younger <laughs> and people playing that game with the horse and the the sheepskin? Anybody remember that? What? Am I the actual no, the the oldest person here? <laughs> I just don't I'm remember check, that I don't part. think I've ever yeah, seen Rambo Check out three. Trent's Spotify playlist. That'll confirm that he's oldest. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> check out. Hey, uh, if you love Ronald Reagan, check out Trent's Spotify Look, playlist. the IROC is still the greatest Camaro that was ever played. Watch his gone with the wind every night. <laughs> what are you even talking about? What is an IROC? What's a Camaro? <laughs> I just wanted to bring out some crazy stuff. So they, they, they play a game where they have like a, it's like a lamb carcass. And there's a bunch of dudes on horses, and there's two circles separated, like 100 meters apart. And they they try to get the lamb carcass and drop it in the, the, the goal on the other side. And these guys, like, beat the crap out of each other. So I'd been to Afghanistan before, and I'm like, okay, Rambo 3 was nonsense. And then we go to this place where they told us we were, like, the first Westerners to be there since, like, Alexander the Great. It was the middle of nowhere. We had to go over huge passes to get there. It was, it was pretty exciting. But, like, that's just, like, the first thing that happened that was, like, just weird. Uh, so we show up. We land in a river, which was, like, my first ex fill into a river ever. It was awesome. And then um, the horse game happened on that trip uh, all within less than a week. We made a toilet. First, we blew up a plastic chair trying to make a toilet. You know that Charlie is like, I can cut a hole in this plastic chair. You know, like, those super, like, uh, weak I know plastic exactly chairs in ones. Afghanistan. John, yeah, no, you get them at Big Lots or at Sam's Town. <laughs> yeah. And they, yeah, exactly. They've got like the corners are slightly raised, which makes them highly uncomfortable to sit in in any configuration. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I can use deck cord to perfectly make a hole in the bottom of this chair. <laughs> you know, we had like a four hour conversation about it. it blew the chair to pieces. We ended up having to use a saw to cut out the bottom of the, the thing. Oh, uh, I wish I could have just seen it just get obliterated and see your face as, as it just blows the entire thing apart. <laughs> I blew up my right eardrum again because there was a uh, the uh, the dishka that we had uh, AD'd right next to my head. So if I'm deaf and I look at your mouth a lot, I'm sorry. But that was the second time that that happened. There was a one-eyed lady in this village, an uh, Afghan lady with only one eye. Lots of conversation surrounding that. Um, one of the Terps almost died, or one of our partner force guys almost died because they sealed their room and then they lit a coal burning stove in there. So like in the middle of the night, like we all come running about our rooms and we're dragging this like Afghan out of his room, and the the Delta had to resuscitate him. And uh, yeah, um, well, and then the rock grenade. We we're sitting around the, we we're in this uh, abandoned girls' school. So obviously the girls' school was no longer in business, and uh, we we're sitting around a fire, and some kids threw a rock over uh, the wall. We didn't know it was rock. It hit me like in the collarbone. It was like the size of a grenade and it falls into the shadows of the fire. So like we all dive out of the way and we freak out, find oh, out it's, it's a rock. terrifying. So we, we run <laughs> out there and, you know, find out it's kids and uh, those kids are okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, that's that's weird. I feel like you didn't need to say it if they were okay, but it's sort of like the implication that made me feel <laughs> odd. They're fine. 
<laughs> the guy that almost killed himself with the coal burning stove, I think he's probably gone now. That's my guess. Not from the um, stove, but from else. The, uh. Yeah, the last thing is on Xville, the, the 47s come in, and these people, like, they're way up north, and it's cold, and, like, the 13,000-foot peaks. And this on top of this house was, like, a whole bunch of hay, right? And you know that they've been storing this stuff for ever and this 47 comes in and flares right over it hard so like we're all getting out of there we're driving the hiluxes back up into the 47s and we're leaving this dude comes running out of his house like his year supply of hay for his horses is gone it's all over the field and uh you know one of our team guys ran out there and handed him a pile of cash and we hopped in the helicopters and left so it was just one of those weird <laughs> things where like in a week like all the weirdest stuff that you could possibly imagine happened at least for me and uh yeah it'll <laughs> and not to mention, uh, one of your guys that you guys know from uh, England, uh, Mole, I didn't have any like cold weather gear, really. It was fun because uh, so South Sea back in the day, weren't we didn't have the best funding or the best equipment. Uh, so or I went the to best one of the people <laughs> or the best ideas <laughs> or, or the best forecast. I'm I leaving. On. I am leaving this podcast now. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was just me being ugly. I'm sorry. Anyway. I just miss you guys so much. Mole basically <laughs> saved my life because he had cold weather kit. And by the time we got back to Noray, which was like 80 degrees down there, I had a, a trash bag that was sitting outside my room. And uh, it was all my Gucci Arc'teryx cold weather gear that I needed a week ago. That would have been real nice, but I almost froze to death. It was exciting. <laughs> I'm going to text Mole right after this. <laughs> yeah. Good, good dude. I always love that. I always love when you like... We ordered a bunch of this cold weather gear. This is in Vegas. We ordered a bunch of cold weather gear because we're like, listen, we're going on a cold weather deployment. It gets cold where we're going. Can we get this cold weather gear? So we stomp on people's desk, a la JMAC, for months and months and months, and we don't get it. They're like, yeah, it just barely didn't come in. We get on a VTC with our sister troop, who at the time was in like Aviano, and they were going somewhere else. And the, the dude hops on the VTC, and he has like one of the jackets. And I was like, y'all didn't order those jackets. Where'd you get that jacket? <laughs> He's like, and he was like, jackets. oh. Exactly. All of them got on and they all had pieces and parts of the stuff that we ordered. We're like, oh, what are you doing? And guess whose team that was? Dun, dun, dun. It was Brian's team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Brian did Ooh. that. Duh. That's what happens to every single piece of kit. You see a dude that walks into the team it was room. The abs- we were so mad at you guys. What, like You guys popped on those VTCs. The only thing that ever made us matter was... Uh, Got on one time. Carrie was especially ornery because he was up for like 76 straight hours this one time. So Carrie was all poopy face. And uh, or, uh, I have to bleep that out in post. <laughs> CO, <laughs> uh, CO basically hops on the VTC and he's eating Italian pizza. And he's got on one of our jackets because it was like slightly chilly at like 55. <laughs> BC lost his mind. <laughs> lost his mind. It was hilarious. Oh, those are the good old days, no one, uh, Vegas. No one likes their Gucci gear the way the PJs do. I just hope that someday I can find someone that looks at me the way the PJs look at Arcteryx. It's that's, the same that's thing for you guys. Life. We used to be at the 321st, and a dude would walk into the team room with some new piece of Arcteryx gear or whatever. And you're like, dude, where'd you get that? Are they giving those Everybody's right little ears pricking up. Like, hey, where'd you, uh, where'd you get that? Did you get that supply here? Did the, you get that in July? I, I, I would buy like a Mountain Hardware jacket or something sometimes and walk into the team room and they're like, dude, are they giving those out right now? Like, yep. Go down to supply. And then but sometimes people wouldn't even <laughs> say anything. They would just get up and walk yeah, out they just and go to supply. Go like, to I got to get out of your dog. What was her name? Bro, where'd you get that watch? The, where'd you the get the supply lady that always smoked and she had like just a haggard voice and she was just like, yeah, I'll get you some of that. Carla. Yeah. Like, <laughs> her name was Carla. I remember exactly. <laughs> hey, what, what, boys? You want one of them outer layers? I'll yeah, get you one of them. Uh, I got you one of them. I got one of them for just for you. Don't tell the whole team. <laughs> Don't tell everyone. Sounds like the. And the greatest supply really person yeah. of all time, X Army. Yeah, okay. no, it's fantastic. No, it was a man. That was a that was a good time. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm not going to bring up age again, but last and certainly not least is uh, peaches. And I'm I'm sorry about all the jokes. I sincerely apologize. <laughs> okay, so do you guys? I, I mean, I've got a couple that I'm mulling around in my head. Are we are we going deployment, or do you want a kind of jackassery, or um, a a heartfelt story about one of our our kick ass brothers. Ooh, I, I don't. I, I almost want to cry today. I was gonna say I almost want to go number three just because we've already covered the jackassery, yeah, and then that way that. we can we can lure him into episode two with your upcoming jackassery story. Okay. All right. So this one this one happened in two thousand and three, September twenty sixth. Uh, happened over in the UK. If you're familiar with the area around Mildenhall, 
then you'll know about the deadliest road in Britain, which is the A1101. The A1101 is an old farming road where the speed limit is 60-ish suggested miles an hour. And on each side of the road, there's no barrier, but on each side of the road, there's about 15 foot ditches. And I mean, they're big enough to fit cars. Generally, they have water in them as well. So uh, I had been, I have only been over in country, uh, in country in the UK for about 20 <laughs> days at that point and uh, became really good friends. And I'm just going to call them RZ. I think we know who I'm, who I'm talking yeah. about. So yeah. PJ, hero among, among men, you know, so uh, me and him kicked it off and became really good friends. And it was a night that was raining really crappy rain and I get a friend and I'm on I'm about to go out partying and I get a frantic phone call from his girlfriend for whatever reason she said hey we've been in an accident come and help us I'm like tell me where you're at and she told me and I mean I'm I'm right there I'm hauling I shouldn't should I, I don't know how fast I was going, but I was hauling and um when I get there I see the wreck I see RZ's car up against a electricity pole. The electricity pole is on top of it and it's starting to spark and get on fire. RZ is doing CPR on a five-year-old. Um, and then I show up and as I'm showing up, he hands off the five-year-old to me and then goes back into that 15-foot ditch filled with water where the car was flipped upside down and he was getting another child. So that happened, or I'm sorry, not that happened. It was a three-year-old baby. Mm. He brings that <laughs> baby out, hands him to me, and then a, a nurse from Lake Eneath showed up and she started helping me as well. RZ goes back into the car Wait, so what t what time of day is this? Is it light out? Like what was it like evening? So it was it was gray hour. It was dusk going into um you know, where the, the transition, gray hour. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Okay. I mean, by the time we left, it was pitch black, but so yeah. RZ goes in for a third time. Grabs a I think 22 month old, something like that brings her out Jeez. and he starts working on her and we are swapping pay i mean just because we're getting we're smoked he's he's got a broken arm as he's doing cpr so what what ended up happening or why it happened and i'm a shitty storyteller so just uh why, how did he the, how did he have to get into the car because it was upside down in the ditch or and he had to open the door and like dive under or was it like every time right. he went in there yeah so so what happened is is his car and her, and the the lady's car she was overtaking passing somebody and didn't judge the distance well enough and they smacked her car flipped over she wasn't wearing her seatbelt. she was ejected the car landed on top of her and the, um, so Ivan went into the car originally because he, you know, as he's approaching it, he can't see that there's kids in the back. He just knows that there's a lady. So he goes into the car upside down, you know, the windows are, I guess they were, I guess they were busted. They must have been busted because I don't know how he would have gotten in there, but um, he felt around the driver's seat, didn't feel anything, right? So he comes out of the water and he's like, well, uh, you know, I don't know where she's at. Then something told him, hey, you go back in there and check the back seat. Checks the back seat, feels kids, you know, and just starts pulling them out. So, yeah, um, that dude, and, and we're going to have him on. He, you know, he's already said he's going to come on and, and anything he'll, he'll talk about. I highly doubt he'll talk about this, but that dude is an absolute beast. I mean, he is a machine. Broken arm, just got in a car wreck. His car's on fire. His girlfriend's hysterical. He's going in to cars. I can't see. 
doesn't know the status of the vehicle in terms of like, okay, is it going to blow up? Is it going to shift, fall on top of me and I can't get out just to go get those kids and then works on them. It was, it was incredible. Yeah. I think it's really so, important to know, like just driving down that road to Ely. I mean, those <laughs> ditches on the side are no joke. Like it is deeper than a car yeah. is like to hold the side of the water. So like when Pete just talked about him going in there or RZ going in there and getting these people out, it's super deep and it rains a lot in England. So, um, those yeah. things fill up. And then quick. trying to get them back up. Like it doesn't even matter. Like you just walking, it, it's almost impossible. It's like a scramble. It's a hands and knees scramble up the side of those fens half the time. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, they're, and when they're we talk, so sharp. Yeah, they really are. And we talked those, uh, those roads like we're, we're saying road but it's it's a true english road so if you've ever pulled into a parking space it's entirely too small where you got to turn sideways imagine that and the parking space next to you and that's the road that you're traveling 60 miles on in opposite directions in the middle of the east anglian like open farmland it's just it's wild like that that road is super dangerous yeah yeah it's 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 pretty wild road to drive on <laughs> for sure so i i know i could probably brought down the uh the the humor level in the room yeah real really but, killed the vibe there i wish we would have i wish we had talked about it beforehand i, I wasn't prepared okay for that i got, sort of I got, I got I'll, I'll pull it and on a I'll good pull one up in a good one <laughs> um this is 2009 this is iraq and we are in an urban shanty complex i mean so you think think um black hawk down in the movie you know it's just it's a rat maze of just you have no idea where you're going so i have an ac-130 overhead I have them sparkle um, the front of our patrol because we're going to go hit a house. Instead of me being next to the commander and trying to tell the point man, hey, okay, turn left now or continue straight because we, we would have passed it already. So I get up front, I start leading, and I'm just following the IR sparkle to our target. And so kudos to the uh, AC-130 guys, as always. They're always top notch. The the SF dudes that I'm with, the ODA guys, they go, "Hey man, you want to see some funny stuff? I bet you will never oh ever." God. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put yeah. you on pause. Listen, if this ever happens to any of you out there, anybody, if ever it ever, especially in 18 Bravo, if they're ever like, "Hey man, you want to see something funny?" <laughs> Say yes. Say yes immediately. Don't think about it. Just get your stuff. If he's like, "Hey, you got to come with me," just grab your bag, leave your bag. I don't care. Just go with him. Okay? It's gonna be the time of your life. Hey, record but on make your sure memory. No one's recording. Yeah. Make sure no one. Yeah. And your make memory. Sure, only, yeah, yeah. On your memory. Yeah. Not on your phone. Not on your, yeah. Yeah. Not on your phone. Not on your, no, 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 no recording. Never. Well, this one's this one's fairly benign, but it, <laughs> it uh, but it was funny because I mean, no kidding. You'll you will never see this again. So. As we approach, there is a kind of, you know, white picket fence, if you will, for lack of better terms. And on the other side of it, the AC-130 had told me, hey, I've got, uh, a, you know, a ma'am, a military age male here, 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 right? And one was right over the fence. And so the guys are creeping over the fence to hold, to lock those guys down. And one of the one of the SF guys is lock, locked down. The guy woke up and he just kind of... Oh my God, you know, right? And that's when the SF guy was like, hey dude, watch this. And he takes his blanket and starts tucking him in, tucking him <laughs> into bed. And he's, you know, making sure it's all nice and tight. That's exactly, he's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, you you're know, fine. And then he, you're fine. It's all a bad and dream. Then, <laughs> and then he took his forehead and he went, <laughs> <laughs> forehead just kiss. gave a forehead kiss. <laughs> And it was just like, okay. And then, and then we, you know, did our call out and went into the house. <laughs> oh, man, that is just the most absolute fancy. Can you put yourself just for a second? Just for a second. So there you are. You're in the middle of your, your courtyard. You're just catching a nap by a fence. Some six-foot-tall, presumably jacked dude with, with full-sleeve tattoos starts tucking you in in full tactical gear. I'd just be like... Take me home, Santa Claus. Here we go. <laughs> All you can see is green, and you can smell Copenhagen coming out of his breath. <laughs> <laughs> and you, all you see is the, gr just the green or the white dip. glow underneath their eyes. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's he smells like rifles like hitting anger. you. Like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Don't say anything. What are you doing? I'm tucking you in. Rip it in Copenhagen. <laughs> just nothing but rip it in Copenhagen. I got to get back because they're making hamsters tonight. <laughs> 
when, when money fails, that's that's what it goes to. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how you make friends on any team. The, that's you know, it. Pro you got tip. them orange. You got them orange rippets. The little oh. those little orange ones. Man, those are those heaters. <laughs> Getting to me. Hmm. I used to. Yeah, we'll save that for another time. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for bringing us back up, uh, Peaches. And uh, there's not a lot to wrap up, but I feel like it would be uh, uh, wrong to not send it over to Brian at the very end to bring this all together and to make a point about this that relates to training somehow and uh, makes this worthwhile <laughs> to watch. All right. <laughs> no pressure. Take it away, Brian. All right. Trent started us out so strong. There's no way you can screw this yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> again, this uh, episode is mostly ad lib. He didn't tell me that I was going to wrap it up, but I will go through a synopsis of every single person's story just to make sure that you guys got it clear. The, <laughs> the big thing oh, and the big that's takeaway fantastic. is you know, you're going to meet the best friends of your life, whether you're going through Indoc or throughout the teams and stuff. We all have these stories that we share together. You know, just like I got close enough with Dust Bunny to, you know, warrant a couple lifetimes there. And we still text each other to this day. And then, uh, you know, Aaron with the anchor, all these things that problem solving, you know, you leave you leave guys with time and resources to try and figure out things and a commander that maybe wants something, you know, and obviously Aaron that wants something that, but didn't, didn't end up getting it, the shell back thing. Uh, but we'll figure I'm so it out. upset about that. I really, am. one of our biggest things is problem solving right there. So I'm going to link that back to problem solving specifically because that was one of the <laughs> coolest things that we did and integrating our sister services into this big task it ended up being a really big thing honestly and when you see the pictures of this 2,000 pound anchor flying through the air that was a really awesome moment for like all the people that were involved in that including the eod guys even though they were kind of butthurt that we ended up picking up the anchor and not them so between that and then all the things that happen on trent's deployment when you go out with uh, any of the army guys or with mole i mean he's he kind of gets into stuff sometimes. He's an interesting <laughs> dude too. But um, when you go out and do stuff with those guys, especially in unexplored territory, our uh, proclivity is to go out there and explore and see what kind of things we get ourselves into. Exactly what uh, Trent ended up happening in that dark week of his life or light week. I don't know, however you want to look at it. So a lot of times... We'll just, just watch Rambo 3. It'll make yeah, sense. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> We end up still, I'm not watching Rambo three. I'm just, I'm so far past it. Yeah. I, I've seen it at one point in my life. I don't know. It was probably a marathon on deployment. <laughs> it was really bad. Yeah. All right. So you, you find these guys that are at the same mindset as you. And I think adventure and, um, just ambition to go out there and see what we can do and explore with the resources we have is something that we all share in common in the special ops community as a whole. And then Jared, um, you know, that awesome story that he brought up with RZ. And like he said, we're going to, we're going to talk to him and bring him on. He's probably not going to share that thing because it, some of those things are obviously difficult to talk about. If you can remember them that vividly, um, Jared obviously has a lot of practice talking about the things that have happened and being able to kind of control himself when he was talking about it. But you can imagine that it was a real difficult time for a long time um dealing with people that are that age in those sort of circumstances um it could be difficult so um between that and then changing over to the darker side or the lighter side of things and uh i guess darker side with those guys that are can't out there. go any darker yeah. than that baby yeah. like let's not it's too late <laughs> Bo, it's too late in the podcast the darker side um talking about those dudes tucking in the uh <laughs> the guys who were raiding the house so um, yeah, altogether, the biggest thing that is in common here is we're going to share these stories, you know, for the rest of our lives. We all have these in common and we can just pick this up from out of nowhere. We didn't talk about any of the stories that we were going to tell or any of that kind of stuff. We didn't like, uh, hint towards what we were going to talk about, but we all have a shared experience. You know, we can all throw in like, oh yeah, that's what it was like, or this is what it was like, or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So, um, it's good to be able to have those friends that you can talk to for the rest of your life and talk about the old days. And you won't find that group outside of special warfare. If you go back to, you know, people that are working in Best Buy or something else, maybe they have stories, but it's not going to be um, probably as fun as the things that we were talking about. So um, again, I appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. Um, we're going to bring out more people for story time, for sure. People that we've been deployed with, people that we we know from past duty assignments. Um, if you know anybody or you can think of anybody that you really want to bring on, we already brought J-Mac. I want to talk to him and I'm going to bring him on again for another story time. But another guy, 
uh, that you guys want us to bring on, just go ahead and shout out and we'll try and get them on see if they have time. But again, make sure you guys go check out um, our partners, our newest partner, which is the Out of Regs Hair uh, Pomade. It's all natural. Um, I use it even on my son while he's going out. So, and he's two years old. So if you're... You know, in, fly is two year old on the block right yeah, there. Exactly. <laughs> just looking so good. This guy's collared shirt on, just all the little little two year olds checking them out. But uh if you want a a natural <laughs> hairstyling product, go ahead and check out Out of Regs. One's ready is the promo code for all of the uh people that we're kind of partnered with. Again, we don't make any money, we just want to get you guys discounts on people that are trying to better themselves, better their family, and help you guys by creating a good product. So go ahead and check those guys out. Additionally, make sure you guys leave us a review, five stars on Apple Podcasts, and then check out the shirts. We're gonna be getting in flags real soon, so make sure you're on the lookout for that. It's gonna be the open water flags again. So check out the website. If there's anything else that we can help you guys with or anything, we're here for you guys. As always, hit us up anytime, and we appreciate you listening. All right? Appreciate you guys, and take care. Sweet. Later, train hard, everybody. Late. Later.